أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters I hope everyone is doing well uh, رمضان كريم رمضان مبارك uh, hopefully uh, this first day of Ramadan has uh, treated you well suited you well um, and uh, as you know, uh, Mizan Institute has uh, set up a number of live sessions, inshallah, for this Ramadan. Uh, these are sessions that are set up specifically for the month of Ramadan. And so some of the topics are going to be different. For those who are following the live sessions before uh, the month of Ramadan, uh, we were discussing the rulings of uh, Salat. And we continued with that topic up until a certain point. Um, but because it's the month of Ramadan, we wanted to take a chance to, or take a moment to go through uh, the topic of tafsir, which is uh, one of the favorite topics uh, of mine, at least, out there. Um, so, uh, funny thing is, today is, is actually the first anniversary of Mizan Life. Because if you guys remember, we started Mizan Life just about uh, the last uh, last Ramadan, we started uh, Mizan Life. So... Uh, it's funny and it feels weird that it's actually been a whole year since we uh, started these sessions and alhamdulillah we've learned a lot and it's really really been a great experience. It's been a learning experience. It's been an experience where uh, we've had a chance to learn uh, quite a bit um, and hopefully with your guys' feedback and your support and with you guys spreading the news we can uh, continue uh, to provide uh, the content that our scholars and our imams and the prophet have provided to us so uh, as you guys know the topic for uh, at least my sessions moving forward in the month of ramadan are going to be or is going to be the tafsir of surah yasin we know that surah yasin is a very special surah i don't i don't think i need to explain uh, too much about that um, thursday night you will see people reciting surah yasin uh, when someone passes away, you will find people are reciting Surah Yasin. Uh, many people actually have memorized some parts of Surah Yasin. So it's one of those surahs that we are very much uh, acquainted with, right? We, we spend quite a bit of time with this surah. However, um, many times you'll find that uh, the brothers and sisters who are reciting the surah, they don't really have an understanding of what the whole surah is even talking about right and so uh, obviously this is something that we have to do even outside of Ramadan but even more so in Ramadan the importance of uh, delving into the Quran becomes uh, a little bit more obvious to us right and I, I do want to mention this before I delve into the topic that if you are planning to recite Quran and hopefully you are and that should be part of our schedule um, be it for half an hour 20 minutes an hour whatever time you get I would very much rather have someone go through the translation and not finish the Quran than just recite the Quran if they don't understand uh, the Arabic in the verses of the Quran, which would cover a you know a very big portion of our communities, uh, you know, unfortunately. But um, so if you're going through the Quran these days and you're doing your maybe you're doing a juz a day or something like that, whatever your uh, schedule allows make sure that you're going through the translation or at least some of the verses you're going through the translation because i will tell you and i mean this is obvious that we are missing out a lot if we don't understand the arabic and we're just reading uh you know uh, the verses so i you know if you ask me if someone were to ask me what should i do i'd say listen if you don't understand the arabic set aside a time half an hour an hour and read as much as you can with the translation the arabic and the translation and, uh, you know, just see how far you can get. If you can't finish, that's completely fine as well, right? So the meaning is very important. All right, so I want to uh, explain a little bit about the sessions, and then uh, we'll dive in. Uh, I was talking to one of the brothers yesterday, and they were telling me, Sheikh, you're going to uh, cover all of Surah Yasin in eight sessions, because we have eight sessions all together, uh, at least f for myself. Sheikh Amin has his own uh, separate sessions. Um, and I was telling them, I was like, yeah, I think I'll be able to cover it because Sheikh Amin, he takes a little bit longer to explain things. I don't think I'll need that much time, uh, you know, to explain things. Now I'm looking at the surah, right? I'm kind of taking, taking my back uh, my own word because <laughs> it's quite, uh, it's actually quite a lot uh, to cover. 
Um, so where are we getting the content that we'll be presenting uh, during this session? So it's coming from three main sources. Number one is Tafsir uh, Nemuna or Tafsir Al Amthal, which is the Arabic translation of Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi, very well known marja of the Shia school of thought. Um, interesting thing about that tafsir is that it's written by a number of people um, in the sense that a number of people have uh, contributed towards it. It's not the work of one person, but it is under his, uh, he spearheaded basically that uh, that whole project. Second one is, of course, of course, tafsir al-mizan, mizan institute, tafsir al-mizan, of course. Um, so that's part of it. And number three is the transcripts of Ayatollah Jawadi's tafsir. Ayatollah Jawadi Amani, a student of Ayatollah of Allama Tabatabai. As you know, he's still doing his tafsir. And his tafsir is called Tafsir at Tasneem. Uh, you know, unfortunately, none of his, uh, you know, no, no, no part of his tafsir has been translated into English as of now. Um, even the Farsi has not, not all of it has been published, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, but Alhamdulillah, they do put up the, the recordings up on his website and also the transcripts of his class. Right. So some of the quite a bit of the points that we'll be mentioning about the verses are actually coming from those which have not actually been uh, published or I should I say translated into English yet. So these are the three main sources that we will be uh, using. I want to take a moment. I'm going to put the link to. Uh, the uh, you know just the surah itself and the translation in the comments section. Salam uh, alaikum, salam alaikum to everybody who's with us. Nice to have you guys with us. So I'm just gonna put this uh, in the comments section. Uh, it's just from alquran.info. This is just to pull up the surah while you got while we're going through the surah together because it's important for you guys to see the verses. Uh, as we're going along, and that link that I put there, it should pop up with the translation of. Uh, a person by the name of Ali Quli Qarai. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm even taking time to put this out there is because his translation, as far as I know, is uh, you know the latest one that we have. Uh, he is, of course, Shia who's translated uh, the Quran, and it's the most fluent that, as far as I know, you know, if if there if we have anything out there that's more fluent than that, please do let me know. I'd be more than you know. I'd love to you know, find out about that. But as far as I know, he's the uh, the latest translation that we have, the most contemporary. So it should pop up with that. Uh, if not, if you guys go on that link and you go to the menu, then you can choose which translation that you want to use. So that's one thing I want to share with you guys. Second thing, this is a little unconventional, but uh, I, I just wanted to share this also with you guys. This is also a recitation of uh, one of the famous Qurra that we have out there, his name is Mushari bin Rashid al-Afasi. This is something that as we go through the surah together during this month, and you guys learn uh, the meaning of the verses, I've always felt like it was an awesome experience that if I learned the meaning of a certain surah, then I started to play the surah in the car or different places that I was, um, then it would be so much better for me. Because like now, when I'm driving, it's like you're talking to God. It's like God is talking to you. On, on the way, right? Because now you understand what the verses are saying. So you can use any any uh, recitation for that, obviously. But this one is just my uh, my my favorite translate, my favorite recitation. Okay, so those are two links. Um, let's move on to the the session itself and the tafsir itself. Let's see how far I got. Now that I said Sheikh Amin takes time to cover stuff, and I don't. Let's see how far I can get now. Okay, so first pointer that I want to mention is why do we read Quran? Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. It's quite obvious. But there is a point that a lot of people, a lot of times, they will um, they will underestimate and they won't pay attention to. Okay, so when we read Quran, of course, there are those who just read Quran just for reading Quran. They don't understand what the Quran is saying. And of course, we're not one of those. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in a session like this. Okay, so obviously, um, having said that, there are different things that people take away from the Quran. Sometimes people come to the Quran, they say, what I'm going to learn from the verses of the Quran are practical principles that I can take away and apply to my life, like right now, right? Which is which are principles that we would describe as tangible principles, right? Uh, so you'll be walking away from the session and say, okay, what did I learn that was tangible today that I could apply 
to my day-to-day -day life, right? We learn from the stories, for example. We learn history. We learn all these different things, okay? So these are all good, and they're necessary, no doubt about any of that. The, the one other thing that happens when you start to read Quran, and this happens when you start to recite Quran more often. So it's something that happens very gradually. It's not something that happens overnight. It won't even happen after you recite Quran once or twice here or there, is this. That slowly, the things that are actually important for God in the Quran start to become actually important in your life and in your worldview. Right. So like every person has a worldview. Worldview is just a fancy word for saying that you have a perspective on things in life. Right. Um, and then in that perspective, certain things are really important. Certain things are not that important. Right. And as human beings, because we're affected by the society that we live in and the environment that we live in, usually we'll take things that are important in society and we will internalize that and we'll say, OK, these are the things that are important in my life. Right. Like, for example, the Arab of the time of the Prophet, certain things were very important for them. Drinking and alcohol was very important for them. Fighting and war was very important for them. Uh, poetry, and a lot of times this poetry was about nonsense. That was very important. Them. Literary abilities, very important for them, right? So we are also, I don't, I don't think I have to explain this too much. We're so much more affected <laughs> by the society that we live in because of the role of media. However... When someone starts to recite Qur'an over and over and over and you become acquainted with the Qur'an or as the ahadith say, you start to be, you start to have uns with the Qur'an, what happens is slowly the stuff that's important for the Qur'an starts to become important for you, right? Those are going to be the main factors in, the, in your life. Those are the things that occupy your mind moving forward, right? So to give you an example, as we go through Surah Yasin, you'll see, and I'm going to explain the four main uh, parts of Surah Yasin. Surah Yasin has four main parts, right? As we discuss, you'll see, we'll get to a part where it's talking about prophets, Right? The more you get acquainted with the Quran, the more you're talking about this prophet came, people disobeyed him, this prophet came, some people believed in him, this prophet, this prophet, this prophet. Because you get acquainted with the Quran in that sense, slowly your thoughts and your thought process and your worldview, prophets and them coming and going become an important thing now, right? So like, uh, celebrities don't really become too much of an important thing anymore. They're still there, right? You still know them, you still acknowledge them, whatever, they exist, right? But you're like, oh, they're not really that important, right? And this is more of an unconscious thing that happens, right? It's a gradual process. Slowly, slowly, you will see that your thought process, you will take into consideration factors that the Quran has been taking into consideration, right? And factors that the Quran does not take into consideration, you also will not really take into consideration too much. Now, as we continue, this will become more and uh, more and more obvious, right? Like, so for example, some verses of the Quran, you will not be able to take away necessarily a tangible teaching from them in the sense that it doesn't tell you to have like good akhlaq or it doesn't tell you to have manners or it doesn't tell you to like contemplate it. It's not that, right? Not all of the verses of the Quran are like that. Some verses of the Quran, some parts of the Quran, the only thing they will do is that they will take your focus a little bit away from this world and have you focus a little bit more on the hereafter. For example, they'll talk about a whole other world being out there, right? There's malaika and like there's jinn and there's like qiyamah is coming up and all this kind of stuff. Just the fact that it takes your focus away from this world, that is very important. And dare I say, this is even more important sometimes than some of the verses that simply give us a, a tangible teaching, right? Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can get us to focus more on the akhirah, that's the key to everything. Then from that, all the other teachings, you can apply them because now you're focusing on the right things, right? So this, brothers and sisters, is very important. Now, today, as we continue, we'll get down to discussing the uh, ahadith that we have about reciting different surahs over there. I'm going to come back to this point and I'm going to explain why this point uh, was so important. Now, um, in case I didn't mention, of course, you guys can...
All right, I don't know if I'm frozen or not. Okay, I think we're good. All right, someone had told me that we were frozen. Okay, let me know if you guys can hear me or see me or... I think we're good now. Okay, perfect. So I don't know where, where it cut off basically. Um, but I was saying, when we get down to uh, re explaining some of the ahadith that we have, when it comes to the thawab, the reward of reciting uh, certain surahs, uh, we'll come back to this main point, that sometimes uh, the fact that the Qur'an can change your focus is even more important than anything else. So we're going to come back to that. Okay, so Surah Yasin. Surah Yasin has around 80 verses. Of course, it's verse 30, uh, Surah 36 from the Qur'an, and it is a Mecki Surah. As you guys know, the Mecki Surahs, as opposed to the Madani Surahs, were Surahs that uh, were re revealed in Mecca. And the main difference, and one of the ways actually that the scholars are able to figure out if they were re revealed in Mecca or they were revealed in uh, Medina is the fact that uh, they look at the content mentioned in the surah. If the content mentioned in the surah is more fundamental topics, things that have to do with the belief system in Islam, then they will usually conclude that this is a Mecca surah. That's not the only way they use, but one of the main ways they use. But when you look at the Madani surahs, the Madani surahs are the surahs where uh, the verses of the Qur'an deal more with the teachings, the day-to-day the day ahkam, as we say. It might be inheritance, it might be hajj, it might be a number of these things. So like when you look at some of the rulings um, that we have, uh, for example, the ruling with, with regards to hijab, the re legislation of the ruling of hijab, right? This came in Surah Ahzab. Verse 31, verse 59, both of these verses talk about this. This was revealed where? Revealed in Medina. Uh, zakat, the legislation of zakat, revealed where? In Medina. The forbidding of drinking, you know, of drinking basically, right? And consuming intoxicants. Uh, the two second verses that really made the big difference, because you know the forbidding of, of uh, intoxicants in Islam, there were three stages to it. The second two uh, verses, they were revealed in Medina. Okay, so this is a main difference between Mecki and Madani surahs. Surah Yasin is a Mecki surah. Therefore, I'm going to explain the four main parts that this surah has. You will find that out of these four parts, m many of them, uh, pretty much all of them, have to do with the belief system. So, first part of this surah has to do with prophethood. This goes all the way up until verse uh, 12, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, about saying that the prophet is actually a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's uh, delivering the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second part of the surah is a story that has to do with two or three prophets who were sent to a group of people and a, dare I say, a mysterious figure who shows up in the middle of uh, the conversation between those three prophets and their people, right? That's the second part. Um, the third part has to do uh, with the Tawheed and the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fourth part has to do with the Day of Judgment and our return, or what they call Ma'at. Okay, so these are the four main parts of Surah Yasin. They call Surah Yasin the heart of the Qur'an. When I say they call it, we have hadith about this. And from what I remember, it was hadith from the Prophet. That Surah Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an. Why is that? Different people have different opinions on this because the Prophet has not mentioned why. Yasin is Qalbul Qur'an. All we know is that he's mentioned that it is Qalbul Qur'an. However, different opinions. Some say that the reason why Surah Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an is because the topics that are that are covered are the most central topics in Islam, right? Like it talks about Tawheed, it talks about Nubuwa, and it talks about Qiyamah, which are the Usul al-Din, right? If you have these three, you are a Muslim. That's one of the reasons why some people, some scholars believe uh, that Surah Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an. Um, quick pointer here, uh, Allama Tabatabai says, I asked my teacher once, I asked him, I said, why do you think the Surah Yasin is mentioned as the heart of the Qur'an? 
um, because unlike what I used to think growing up, it's not in the middle of the Quran, right? <laughs> growing up, I used to think that Surah Yasin is the heart of the Quran because it's in the middle of the Quran, right? Um, even though the heart isn't even in the middle of the body either, right? But anyways, he says, I asked my teacher, why is it that uh, Surah Yasin is the heart of the Quran? His teacher is Ayatollah Qadi. He said this, he said, the reason for that are the couple last verses in Surah Yasin. A couple last verses in Surah Yasin are very famous verses. <inaudible> His command is that whatever he wants something to come into existence, he says to it, Kun fayakun, فَسُبْحَانَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ كُلُّ Blessed or perfect is the one who in his hands and in his power and under his control is malakutu kulli shay. Every human, every being, not every human being, every being has a mulki aspect which has to do with his uh, existence in this world. And then it has a malakuti aspect. It has to do with his existence in realms higher than this world. Okay, that's called malakut. The verse is saying the malakut of everything is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have the malakut of everything in the hand, in, in, in your hands, that means the central uh, existence of everything is in your hands. He says this is why the, the Surah Yasin is called Qalbul Quran. Because the same way Qalb is central to the existence of the human being, the malakut of everything is also central to the existence of everything. Now, these are a little, uh, you know, high level stuff we're covering here, but, you know, just, just for us to know and think about a little bit. I'm going to move on. Moving on to the ahadith that we have for the reward of reciting uh, different surahs. Now, I'm going to mention this hadith. This, brothers and sisters, is a very important uh, topic to discuss. Um, as you can see, I am very anxious to get to the surah itself and start discussing the surah itself, but we have to cover this before we get to discussing uh, the surah itself. So, um, the first point that I need to mention is this. Um, let, me, let me share the hadith that we have with regards to reciting Surah Yasin in particular, and the reward that has been mentioned to it. And then we have to have a little bit of a discussion about these different hadith that we have about reciting different surahs, okay? So, this hadith is from Imam Sadiq, sallallahu alayhi He says, فَمَنْ قَرَأَ يَاسِينَ فِي نَهَارِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يُمْسِي كَانَ فِي نَهَارِهِ مِنَ الْمَحْفُوظِينَ وَالْمَرْزُقِينَ حَتَّى يُمْسِي He says, whoever recites Surah Yasin during his day, قَبْلَ أَنْ يُمْسِي Before, you know, night time, كَانَ فِي نَهَارِهِ During that day, he will be من المحفوظين. He will be from those who are protected. Right, and from the latter part of the hadith, it's clear that this protection is protection from shaitan. Wal marzuqin, and he will be given rizqa. Rizq is not just financial rizq; it could be any type. It could be knowledge. It could be different things that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives blessings. Wa man qara'aha fi laylatin qabla an yanam, and whoever recites it at night before he goes to sleep, wakila bihi alf malakin, a thousand angels will be. Appointed to him, يَحْفَذُونَهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْطَانٍ رَجِيمٍ وَمِنْ كُلِّ آفَةٍ These thousand angels will be protecting him from a shaytan al-rajim, shaytan who has been cast away, وَمِنْ كُلِّ آفَةٍ And from every, uh, I want to say, um, I don't know what the best translation for afa would be, what, but you know, from every problem or every disease, right? It could be a physical, it could be a, a spiritual disease, okay? This is one of the hadith that we have regarding uh, reciting Surah Yasin. And there are many others as well. The point that I want to make about this, these hadith that we have, brothers and sisters, is this. When we talk about these hadith, we have to be very careful. Okay? Why? So, three pointers, and these three pointers are going to uh, summarize our discussion regarding these ahadith. Okay, and you, if you guys have questions, because I do think this part will bring about questions in your mind, uh, feel free to uh, send them in. Um, yes, calamity, as the brother is saying, that, that would be a good translation. Um, first pointer, what is it meant when they say, if you read the surah, okay? The reason why we have to have this discussion is because some of these ahadith, when you 
here. What happens if you read this surah? It's a little bit of a question mark in our minds. Like if I just read the surah, this will happen, right? So for example, hadith might say, if you re re uh, recite surah to nur, this is real hadith. If you recite surah to nur, a person will be protected from adultery. A person will be more modest if you recite surah to nur. So what does that mean? That means if I just recite this surah, then this is going to happen to me, right? Is that what it means? Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi in his tafsir, he says, no, when these ahadith say you read, he means in the sense of reading and acting upon it, which is a big difference now. He says you have to understand it in that context. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense if just by reading this, something would happen inside of me, right? And his one of the arguments that he makes is this. He says, listen, if you pay attention, a lot of these ahadith that explain the reward of a certain reciting a certain surah, if you pay attention, you will see that there is an actually a connection between acting upon that surah and that reward that's mentioned in that hadith. So he says, Surah An-Nur, for example, it says, if you recite it, you will be away protected from adultery. Well, uh, what is Surah An-Nur about? <laughs> right? Right? It's about what? It's about the issue of like uh, one of the main topics is about what? Uh, the issue of adultery. So he says here, this is even a clue for us that when the Quran or the Hadith says that if you recite these surahs, this will happen in your life. It means if you will recite it and try to act upon it. Okay. So that's the first point that we have to keep in mind. That these, these ahadith that we read about the thawab or as we say the fadilah, of certain surahs, at the very least, you'd have to say, hey, if that, that's going to be there, that reward or that effect will be there, if at least you try to act upon it. If you're not even trying to act upon it, then, you know, like, it's very difficult to say just because you recited the surah, this is going to happen, okay? Not talking about those ahadith that say you will get this reward or that reward, like hasanat. Hasanat are not a problem. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is great. He can, uh, 10,000 hasanat for this, a, a million hasanat for that. That's not the part that, that brings questions into our minds. No, we're talking about a hadith that talk about the effects a certain surah is going to have in your life if you recite them. Does that mean if you recite them once that's going to happen? According to Ayatollah Shirazi, Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi in his tafsir, he says no. This is has to be understood in the context of you recite this and at least you're trying to act upon it. So that's number one. Number two, some of these ahadith brothers and sisters are not 100% reliable. Does it mean that they're fabricated? No, a lot of times we can't say that either, but we're just not 100% sure about them. Why? Some of these ahadith are what we call mursal, in the sense that if you look at the chain of narrators, right? Imagine I'm the person who's telling you the hadith. I say, I got it from this person and he got it from him and he got it from him. He got it from him. Well, naturally this chain of narrators is supposed to go and hit who? It's supposed to hit like an imam or the prophet, right? Sometimes this chain of narrators ends somewhere and it's not an imam or a prophet. So how did that person get it? We don't know exactly, right? So that's the second thing. For example, we have hadith and then you take a look at some of these ahadith brothers and sisters. We have hadith that the uh, Imam al-Baqir sallallahu alayhi qal kullu man lam tubri'hu suratul hamd wa qul huwa allahu ahad lam yubri'hu shay whoever suratul hamd and surah ikhlas does not take care of his disease ibra means to cure whoever these surahs does not cure him lam yubri'hu shay nothing will cure him that's a little questionable when you look at the hadith it's actually you look at the chain of narrators it actually doesn't even go back all the way to the fifth imam in the sense that this like the person who is not even living with the fifth imam he jumps a couple generations right imagine i came a hundred years after the fifth imam i say the fifth imam said this that's how this hadith has been narrated now can we say it's necessarily fabricated no it's very this is why we have scholars they can worry <laughs> worry about this stuff but my point is some of these hadith are not so reliable as we think they are Okay, in fact, one of them is about, um, if I'm not mistaken, Surah uh, Yasin in particular. Right. Okay, that's the second point. Third point, and inshallah, we'll move on to the first verse from the Surah, is this. Brothers and sisters, some of these ahadith um, 
they sometimes there are certain things mentioned in some of these ahadith that you know it can't be true. If a hadith says, listen, if you recite this surah, you will definitely be in heaven. And we understand it in the sense that if you recite this surah, whatever you do, you'll be where? In heaven. There's no way that can happen. Because there is no part in our religion that relieves anyone from their duties for the rest of their life. There is no such a thing, right? And this is a longer discussion. This discussion comes up when people talk about us being Shia and the intercession and the Shafa'ah and all of that kind of stuff. And the Imams themselves have refuted this idea that because you have the right belief system, then you are relieved of your duties. Similarly, the same concept can be applied here with these hadith. If a hadith comes to you and says, hey, if you recite this surah, that's it, you're in heaven, no matter what you do. Uh, this is, we can't accept this, right? Either we have to understand the hadith in a different way, where we say, ah, uh, it means if you recite this surah and you don't do anything wrong afterwards, or let's say if you were to pass away afterwards, right, then your place would be in heaven. That makes sense. Right? Or we'll have to say that we can't accept the hadith. Right? So these are three pointers to remember when we are talking about a hadith that have to do with the thawab of uh, reciting different surahs. Let me know if you guys have questions about these. So I just want to make sure there aren't any misunderstandings about this topic because I know that it's a little bit of a... Um, you know, sensitive topic. Now, you might say, oh, Sheikh, so all of these ahadith they mention about uh, thawab of this, thawab of that. Uh, so what? There's no, no thawab now? Brothers and sisters, this is why I've made that point at the beginning of the discussion. Brothers and sisters, well, first of all, we know reciting Quran has a lot of thawab. I mean, even if we don't have a particular hadith, if someone doesn't come to you tonight and say, if you recite Surah Yasin, you get a thousand hasanat, you're not going to recite it? No, we all know it has so much thawab, number one. Number two, brothers and sisters, if someone wants to grow spiritually, even more important than just gaining hasanat here and there is for him to invest in himself, in his worldview. That's why we mentioned that point earlier, that sometimes when you get acquainted with the Quran, it starts to change your worldview. When you change your worldview, brothers and sisters, Hasanat will come to you left and right, right? If you have the right worldview, if you're focused on Qiyamat, oh, you will make all the, the Hasanat that, that, that's out there, right? Because you're working for the right purpose. You have your eye on the prize, as they say, right? But if someone is just after Hasanat, then they're only after doing this small act of worship, that small act of worship. In the long run, the person who has the right worldview, who's invested in his spirituality by being acquainted with the Quran, he will be miles ahead of the person who's just only after hasanat. I'm going to recite this surah. I don't understand anything from it. Just recite this surah. Why? Because that's hasanat. Well, that's good. But the other one who recites it with the translation and actually changes his worldview a little bit. Oh, he's way ahead. So let's approach this surah uh, in this way, inshallah. Okay. Uh, Brother Ali is saying, I love that so many people, uh, I love that point, so many people think they can do whatever and they, whatever they want if they cry for Imam Hussain, and that no matter what they do, they will instantly go to heaven without any accountability. Yeah, so I mean, that was something that we covered on the side indirectly. We were talking about the ahadith that say that if you do, like recite this surah, you will be your, like for example, from what I remember, some of the ahadith say, um, you know, for example, let's just say for the sake of uh, you know, for the sake of the example, we'll say if a hadith were to say that if you recite this, your your aqibat is going to be khair. You're going to be on the right path. Well, we have to see how we're going to understand that. Does it mean if I pass away right now and I don't do anything wrong, I'll be on the right path? OK, maybe. But if it means that I can do whatever I want to do, none of the scholars are going to accept that. That's not, uh, sorry, brothers and sisters. <laughs> no scholar is going to accept that, unfortunately. Um, okay. All right. Finally, let's get to the first verse of Surah Yasin. Yasin wal Quran al Hakim inna kalamin al Mursaleen. Okay. Yasin. What is Yasin? Here is a discussion. Scholars say different opinions. Some of them say, you know what, Yasin is uh, actually huruful muqatta'a in the sense that 
similar to other verses of other surahs of the Quran that we have Alif Lam Mim, we have Alif Lam Ra, we have Kaf Ha Ya Ain Sad, we have all of these different things. Uh, this Yasin is also one of them. Most of the scholars do not agree with this. They say Yasin is either a name for the Prophet or it is short for Ya Sayyidul Mursaleen. Or it is short for Ya Sami Al Wahi, Sayyidul Mursaleen, the greatest of the Mursaleen, right? The head of the Mursaleen, the head of the prophets. Or Ya Sami Al Wahi, the one who's the one who's hearing the revelation, right? They say it's a short for this or that, or it's the name of the prophet. Now, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli makes a very beautiful point, and I'm going to move on from this quickly because we want to get down to the meaning of Surah Yasin, not just what Yasin means, but. He says, listen, in verse number three, it says, Yasin, wal Quran al Hakim, inna kalamin al Mursaleen. He says, Yasin must be the name of the Prophet. Otherwise, it would not make sense for verse number three to have a pronoun in it. When we use pronouns, brothers and sisters, right? You mention someone's name and then you use a pronoun usually, right? So the fact that it says, inna ka, certainly you. That means that he must have mentioned or addressed the Prophet before. Therefore, he says Yasin should be uh, addressing the Prophet. Now, either it's the name of the Prophet or it's short for Yasid al Mursan. It is not like Alif Lam Mim, I don't know, Alif Lam Mim Ra, Kaf Ha Ya Ain Saad. It's not like any of those. Okay. Wal Quran al Hakim. We swear by the Quran that is Hakim. Inna kalla min al Mursaleen. Certainly, you are amongst those who's been sent to people. You're a Prophet. Ala Sirat al Mustaqim, you are on a straight path. Tanzil al Aziz al Rahim. And this Quran is Tanzil. Okay, so let's dive into this a little bit. Wal Quran al Hakim, we swear by the wise Quran, inna kalamin al Mursaleen. We swear that you're one of the prophets. First question that should come to your mind, like the first question that should come to your mind here is this Why is God trying to prove that the prophet is a prophet by swearing? in its own Qur'an, in his own Qur'an. That doesn't really make sense, right? If I come to you and say, listen, brother, I know what I'm talking about, right? He said, you tell me, oh, how? Shaykh, prove it to me. I say, I swear I know what I'm talking about. Well, that's not proving it, right? Although um, for a lot of our brothers and sisters in our communities, it is. <laughs> that's how you prove stuff. <laughs> but point is, you can't prove stuff just by swearing it. However, Mufassirin make this very beautiful point. They say, when the Qur'an swears, wal Qur'an al-Hakim, he is swearing and the proof is right there. That's why he says, wal Qur'an al-Hakim. Pay attention. He says, I swear by the Qur'an that has wisdom in it. Well, that's God's miracle. So the proof is in this, in that, uh, is, is in the Wal Quran al Hakim. Now he can say, in the Kalamin al Mursan. Why? Because there's Al Quran al Hakim. There's a wise Quran. Think about this, brothers and sisters, right? The, probably the biggest proof that we have for the Prophet being a Prophet, obviously the biggest proof, is this that it doesn't make sense at all that all of this book, right? which makes a lot of sense. Some part of it, some parts of it, we may not be able to understand, right? And some parts of it we may have questions about, right? Because we're ignorant, right, as human beings. But all of this just came from some man living in the middle of a desert 1,400 years ago who didn't study. Listen, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter, like, you know, you can, you, anyone can take the Quran and say, oh, I don't, this part of it has a problem, that part of it has a problem. That, we'll leave all of that for later. As a body of work, there's no way someone can look at the Qur'an and say, you know what, it makes sense. Yeah, a man living in the middle of the Arabian desert just one day came up with all of this. It just doesn't make sense, right? You can't say that about other, other books because other books, when I say other books, I mean other holy books, New Testament, Old Testament, because they are not even going back to the time of their prophets. Uh, and this is a historical known fact, written years after them. The Old Testament, we're not even sure who wrote them. They say four different people wrote them. Uh, New Testament is different books written by 14 different authors, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, that doesn't even come up with regards to other holy books. But wal Quran al Hakim. So the proof is where? Proof is in the swearing itself. This book that has wisdom, that's proof for inna kalamin al mursaleen. Ala sirat al mustaqim, you are on a straight path. 
Tanzil al Aziz al Rahim. This Quran is Tanzil. Tanzil comes from Nazala, which means to send down something. But when you put it in the form and in the shape of Tanzil, it means to send down something gradually. He says, This is the book of Al Aziz al Rahim. This is God situating uh, his attributes in a beautiful way. He says, This is the revelation of the one who's very mighty and proud. And at the same time, he is Rahim. At the same time, he is merciful, right? Um, it's beautiful. Ayatollah Jawadi Amali says, this Quran that we have and the real Quran that's up there, that's why the Quran says Tanzil, because it has been sent down. When we say it's been sent down, doesn't mean like the books, like it doesn't mean like the paper was sent down, right? It means that the concepts and the truths that the Quran speak about have ascended toward, oops, sorry, have descended towards us, right? So he says this Tanzil is just like a rope. One side of the rope is in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other side of the other side of the rope is in our hands. Our hands is the lower side of the rope. It is a side that we understand a little bit easier, right? The other side is in his hand. That's why in the verses of the Quran, he says, This same Quran that is, a, is, is on the, from the material perspective, is a bunch of Arabic words. Don't look at it this way. This is the, the share of the Quran that you guys receive. The share of the Quran that we receive or we have with us, that is Aliyun Hakim. That's very high. You guys don't understand that. We give you the simpler version of it, right? That's why the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, and I'm going to start ending, inshallah, in a couple minutes. Let me know if you guys have any questions. That's why in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, the Quran says, uh, kitab. That book. Whereas the Quran, you're holding it when you're reciting it, right? It should say, Hadha al-kitab. It says, Dhalika al-kitab. So the Quran has multiple levels. These different levels, one on the lowest level is the Arabic that we have in front of us. At the highest level is a living being that we don't even understand, right? But the point is that it's like a rope. If you take this lower level and you start climbing, then you will get there. In the words of Ayatullah Jawadi Amuli, he says, this is why the Quran says, وَعَتَسِمُ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? He says the Quran is this rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, moving on uh, from that. لِتُنْذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنْذِرَ آبَاءُهُمْ فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ Ya Rasulullah, we have sent you to do in dhar, to give a warning to those who their fathers were not given a warning. فَهُمْ غَافِلُونَ Because of that, they're negligent. Because of that, they're oblivious. To Qiyamah, they're oblivious to their accountability and all the things that we believe in as Muslims. This is why we sent you, Ya Rasulullah. Okay, question. The Quran says, We sent you to do in dhar, to give warning to a group of people that their fathers were not warned. So, wait a second. Other verses of the Quran say, We send a prophet for every group of people. How is this that the Quran is saying a group of people were not uh, given warning? I'll try to explain this in a couple minutes. Brothers and sisters, the Quran says we send a prophet to every qawm. We send a prophet to every ummah, as we say. But does that mean the message is necessarily sent exactly to each and every person? Not necessarily. You want proof for that? Go and knock your neighbor's door. He's standing right there. That's, that's your proof, right? Um, don't do that. I'm just saying. <laughs> Point is, there are many people that we know that the message has not been sent to them individually. However, they are part of an ummah that has a prophet. Which ummah is this? This is the ummah that we have. Who is their prophet? Prophet Muhammad is their prophet, right? So the Quran says we have sent for every qawm, every ummah a prophet. Doesn't mean that the message has has been sent directly to every single individual and there is hikmah and there is wisdom uh, in that as well nonetheless he says because of that these people they are ob oblivious in islamic theology 
there are times between great prophets where the message that they had sent, although the message was out there, as is the case right now, Islam's message is out there, but it was not, basically the people of the time would hide it, right? And it was hidden. These were times known as the times of Fatra, okay? Now, between the times of different big prophets, this idea of Fatra used to happen. And inshallah, we're out of time. Inshallah, uh, next session, uh, we'll discuss that more. First of all, we'll discuss, and just to give you a, a quick, uh, some of the stuff we'll discuss next week. First of all, why does the Quran says where we sent you to give warning? Why don't we? Why don't you send the Prophet to give good news? Islam is here to give us warning and to give us good news, right? It's in Dar and Tabshir. Why does the Quran say we sent you to give them warning? Okay, so that's one question we got to answer. Uh, later on, we'll discuss. The next verse says that our decree has been established for them. They will not believe. So what, God is doing things that people can't believe anymore? I thought people have free will. That's something else that we'll have to discuss. Moving on from that, what happens when someone doesn't believe on purpose? God starts to put shackles on their necks. They don't, they're not able to do certain things. What are those things that they're not able to do? God starts to put barriers in front of them and, and behind them. What does that mean? These are all stuff that we will discuss, uh, inshallah in uh, in the next session um some very beautiful stuff coming up also the shatn and nuzul of these verses we'll discuss those inshallah in our next session which will be uh wednesday thank you very much uh for everyone uh being with us uh i do see that uh, a sister has sent in a question how would we know what hadith is reliable or not as a layperson that's a very good question usually in the books of tafasir before they start discussing the meaning of a surah, they will mention a couple ahadith about the reward of reciting a certain surah. When it's coming through the filter of a mufassir, who is usually a scholar who knows hadith as well, then they will look into that uh, as well. So that's the best way uh, to approach it. Most of these ahadith are not you know, a uh, matter of concern. Sometimes they do become a matter of concern. Like I mentioned, if you recite this, you're good to go forever and that kind of stuff. You know, that that's where things become a little problematic. But nonetheless, we all know reciting Quran has so much thawab. We're in the month of Ramadan. The Prophet said, وَمَنْ تَلَى فِيهِ آيَةً مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Whoever recites one verse of this Quran, كَأَنَّهُ I can't remember the exact Arabic phrase. It's as if he recited the whole Quran. So, um, obviously, we obviously need to uh, double down on, on reciting Quran in this month. Okay, thank you very much, Sheikh Amin. We'll be with you guys uh, tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum to all of those who I missed to say assalamu alaikum to. Uh, Sheikh Amin will be with you guys tomorrow. He'll be continuing his Shia Imamiya doctrine uh, discussion. And inshallah, we'll continue with the tafsir of Surah Yasin uh, on uh, Wednesday, inshallah. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.